Right, so the first line we're going to look at um, is a very important and underrated line in my opinion. It's a line that you are going to get fairly often. Um, and that's after playing bishop b5 check in the Moscow Sicilian. Move knight c6. Now, this is the third most played move in this position. Um, the move bishop d7 has been the main line uh, by far for many, many years, blocking the check in a very natural way. But the move knight to d7 has really come about, I would say, um, over the past 10, 15 years as a serious way for black to attempt to play for win against the Moscow Sicilian. Black blocks the check in a very unnatural way in order to potentially uh, obtain the bishop pair. And uh, it's a very unbalanced way to uh, to play, very ambitious way to play against bishop b5. However, the next most natural way to play against this is to play the move knight c6. Now, of course, I want to point out very simply that we can get, after two knight c6, bishop b5, d6, can come about as a transposition. So the, the lines with this particular position will be dealt with here and not in the section on the Rosalima. Knight c6, what's this move all about? Well, you're blocking the check. Uh, you're bringing the knight out to its most natural square. It's got to be a completely fine move. And now as white, uh, I suggest just castling, perhaps opening up some options for going d4, uh, if black doesn't uh, hurry up and defend against the threats and play the move bishop to d7, which is the main move, uh, by some distance, and the move you're going to get almost all of the time. And we're going to be looking uh, at the game first off between Emil Sutovsky and Grebyonkin from 2003, uh, featuring a sideline uh, which is, uh, you're going to get, you know, a fair amount of the time. And knowing some of the tactical motifs that Emil presents in this game, I think, is, is really essential. So after bishop d7, we should almost always play the move rookie 1 here. It's not g5, although that is a move we, ironically, we'll see in other lines. And uh, in this position here, black tends to play uh, two main moves. So this is the main kind of spot of rookie one. And you can see there the arrows on the board I've highlighted because the move rookie one not only brings the rook into the game, protects the e4 pawn, but it vacates the f1 square for this bishop. Uh, now, that might not look like much, but in a lot of positions, especially after the main line, which is going to be discussed in some other games, which goes knight f6, White now plays c3, aiming at building his perfect central duo. And after a6, the move bishop to f1, just bringing the bishop back to uh, safety on f1, has been the main move for many years, and it's a move we're going to be analysing in this series. Nevertheless, after rookie 1, black can alter the move order here and play the move a6 first, which uh, looks like a perfectly natural move, you're putting the question to the bishop. And now, of course, white can play the move uh, bishop to f1 here. Uh, this has been played before, but it's not as good in this particular position because here black can actually play the move bishop g4. And getting in c3, d4 here is not as easy. So after a6 immediately, and that's a6 before knight f6 in this position here, rookie 1a6, I actually recommend that we play Ala Sutovsky and take on c6 immediately. Black takes back with the bishop, and now we open up the center. So we've given up the two bishops here as white, fine. Now what do we have in return? We're going to open up the center and utilize the central concentration of our pieces to actually pose black some serious problems. D4, as in every Sicilian. And now I recommend you take back on d4, like Sutovsky did with the queen. Taking back on d4 with the knight is perfectly fine and perfectly reasonable. In fact, it's been played by a bunch of top players. But Sutovsky 
and Chris Ward even have tended to take back. I, I'm sorry, Gawain Jones against Chris Ward, I should say, have t- t- tempted to take back on tended to take back on d4 with the with the queen. I think this is a more aggressive option. It's an, an option I like. Now, that's not to say if Black knows what he's doing that he can't get a perfectly fine position. But I think, practically speaking, dealing with this move over the board is quite difficult. So when you take back with the queen on d4, you do so because that queen can't really be bothered apart from one way, which is for black to play the move pawn to e5. But as soon as he does that, let's just say, for example, he did it in this position here, white will drop his queen back to d3. And what black has done is he's given himself a backwards pawn here on d6, which can be attacked along the d-file in many ways. And white can just simply occupy this d5 square in a very kind of um, uh, well-known way in these Sicilians. So this is more of like a Sveshnikov structure, but black has to be really careful that white just doesn't build up a lot of pressure against a d6 pawn and put one of his knights on d5. We're going to have a look at some other lines. So after queen takes d4, um, what black tends to do uh, and what Greb Yoldenkin did is play the move knight f6. And now I recommend white simply play the move knight to c3. Uh, we did actually see Gawain Jones against Chris Ward play the move bishop to g5, e6, and now knight bd2. Very interesting setup. Looking at putting the knight on a more dynamic square, such as the c4 square. But as it turns out, I don't think this is that good. And I prefer just playing the much more simple much more natural move knight c3. And already in this position, and the reason why I'm proposing this, so many tactics are going to be available shortly. Black has to be very, very precise to maintain the balance. So, as an example, what if black plays the move g6, like you would if you were a dragon player or um, you know you like fear chattering your bishops? Well, here, White has now got a very, very uh, serious idea, e5. Remember how I spoke about having the central concentration of pieces. It's really important that we utilize the positioning of our pieces when we can, especially when our opponent's king is still stuck in the center. So the move e5 is extremely dangerous for black. Um, black has to take. If he takes on f3, he loses to e takes f6, uh, opening the e-file, pieces are equal, f takes e7, and queen takes h8. Next is coming, so you can't even consider that. You have to take on e5, and now white can simply take back on e5. Suddenly, white has got an uh, unusual kind of threat. Queen takes f6, simply winning a piece because of the pin. Uh, same idea with bishop takes f3, you just go queen takes f6 here and it showers already for black, he can resign, losing a whole piece. So you have to go bishop g7 here, and this is where white has got an absolute humdinger of a tactic, and one that you guys are going to remember in this particular variation. The move bishop to h6, wow we Amazing move. The idea, of course, is that uh, if bishop takes h6, not only... Can you play queen takes f6 in this position? But here, maybe black can survive with the move castles. But you've actually got the stunning idea, rook a to d1, first. And the reason why this is a stunning idea is because now you're actually kicking this queen away from d8, and there's a mating threat on e7, so queen c8 just runs into mate. And it's, it's basically curtains here. If you go bishop d7, well, now white can take on f6. And after castles, there's this nasty pin here. So white can just play a move like rook takes e7, for example. And black is just going to lose uh, this d7 bishop very, very easily. Uh, bishop to g7, you can probably just come back to h4. And I don't see how black survives. So rook a d1 actually is just the end of the game. Maybe black's best move here is just to castle and give up the queen, but a queen for two pieces really shouldn't be enough and white should have an advantage. So the only move for black to stay on the board here is actually to play the move castles immediately, after which, and this is the game Karyev against uh, Sevdimilayev, 
uh, from 2016, why it takes on g7. And now it's very important to play the move knight to d4. You don't want to take on e7 here and allow your crippling of your kingside pawns with bishop takes f3. So you want to play the move knight to d4, uh, keeping that knight, hitting that bishop, and now you're threatening to take on c6 and then take on e7. Black has to go rook e8, and after rook ad1, uh, we conclude this variation with a very clear uh, evaluation of white is better. You've got a beautifully centralized queen on e5, your knight hitting that bishop on c6. Uh, black is king is awkwardly placed. You've got your rooks perfectly centralized. I think it's clear that white is a little bit better here. So g6 already in this position is, in my opinion, uh, a bit of a mistake. Um, the move e5 is the next move we have to consider, apart from the move e6, which is the stem game Sutovsky versus Gray. So what happens after e5? Well, we drop our queen back to d3, and now black has got a very important move to play. And that is the move pawn to h6. The reason why this is important is because black has to stop white playing bishop g5. So for example, if black plays bishop to e7 here, white plays the move bishop to g5 and gets his ideal setup. Because now after h6, White is absolutely happy to exchange this bishop for the knight, and this is a motif that you guys really have to remember. And after bishop takes f6, to bring this rook into d1, hitting this d6 pawn, the bishop might have to go back to e7, and now white has got a whole bunch of ideas. But white, for example, could immediately play the move knight d5, threatening to get rid of this bishop and win the pawn. And if bishop takes d5, queen takes d5, we reach a very well-known position where white has got in many aspects, uh, a clear positional advantage. The black bishop is extremely passive against this white knight, and this white knight is going to find its way either to the d5 square, the f5 square, the c4 square. White, uh, black has got all of these targets, whereas white is completely safe. The, the, if the rook ever goes to c8, you put your pawn on c3, and it's simply a position that is one of the most inferior kind of Sveshnikov positions that you could get with black. Black absolutely has to play the move h6 to avoid this exchange of bishop for knight. And now I suggest the move knight to d2. Very well-known move in these positions. It looks odd blocking in your bishop, but the idea is to reroute the knight via the c4 square. So uh, black will most likely play the move pawn to b5, as per the game uh, Guyot versus Kolas or Shyam versus Jumaev. And now I'm going to suggest a very important novelty. In both of those games, White played the very meek a3. We're not going to be meek. We are going to meet things with energy and play the move pawn to a4 in this position. Very important move. The reason behind that is you want to force Black's hand. So when he plays the move b4, you can now play the move knight into d5. And the c4 square has become available. So let's say Black takes on d5 with the bishop. You take back with the pawn, bishop to e7, and now another very important subtle positional move here for white, the move a5. We've seen this and learned this idea from actually positions in the anti-martial Spanish, uh, where white now fixes these pawns and disjoints these pawns. So that can now not can, you know, bring these pawns together, meaning they're two permanent weaknesses. And on top of that, we've now fixed a square here on b6 as well, potentially for our knight to jump into after it goes to c4. So, for example, knight to d7, knight to c4, castles and bishop to e3. Black can try and gain some space on the king side with f5, but after f3, I think it's absolutely clear that white has got a fantastic position here. Black is going to be tied down to the defense of these two weak pawns for a very long time. If black ever commits with f4, we can just slide back to the f2 square. Now he gives up another important square on e4. Meanwhile, this bishop here on e7 is really struggling to get into the game. So I think this move a4 in this position, a serious theoretical uh, novelty and one that we'll see a bit more. So e5, nothing to worry about. As per the game, Sutovsky will grab Yonkin and the move you're going to get for the Lion share if they play a6 in this variation very early is the move nine pawn to e6. Well, we continue as normal. As with as normal, and what I mean by as normal is by playing the move knight to d5. Uh, you can play bishop g5 here, of course, that's a very uh, 
well-known idea, and after bishop e7, rook a to d1. But if you compare this to the lines with knight, uh, uh, sorry, e5, black simply doesn't have the kind of weaknesses. And the problem with white here is that if you take on, uh, on f6, let's say black castles, and you take on f6 here, looks as though things are great, because you say, well, you know, he has to go g takes f6, and we cripple his kingside. No. In this position here, black can just play the move bishop takes f6, and this is a move that is often uh, completely underestimated here. And after queen takes d6, black can either take on d6 first, or take on c3, whatever he wants, or play the move queen a5. But the point is that these, these positions here, just because white has won a pawn, look at the pawn he has actually got here. I mean, these pawns are just disgusting, sitting on the, the open c file. And actually, these positions are completely fine for black, for example, uh, as, as played by uh, Grandmaster Evgeny Vorobyov in 2004. This position here is just absolutely fine for black. Um, the extra pawn is worthless. So you can play bishop g5, but it doesn't actually bring much. It's not critical. But the move knight d5 is going to really send the shivers up your opponent's spine. And um, Sutovsky is the kind of guy we want to watch when this kind of typical Sicilian motif takes place. So what is knight d5 all about? Well, obviously, it's a peace sacrifice. I guess the first thing we have to try and understand is what happens after e takes d5. Well, e takes d5 is just not very good, because after e takes d5 check, we win not only the pawn back, but we open up with check. So after bishop e7, we can take on c6, b takes c6. And here white has got a whole bunch of uh, moves, but you know if you really uh, wanted to in this position, you could play bishop g5, you could stop the black from casting with a move like queen to e3. Um, there are many, uh, many different ideas here. Uh, for example, you could even play the move queen to a4 here. Just targeting this weak c6 pawn, and then after queen d7, maybe play knight d4. And after rook c8, you can go bishop g5. And after castles, well, you can even just nab a pawn here on a6. And this isn't necessarily the only way to go in this position. So, um, you know, e takes d5 simply uh, it isn't good enough for equality. White, white will just get a commanding position. The same goes, actually, if black decides to take on d5 with the knight. Knight takes d5. Well, now we take back on d5. And lo and behold, we've once again got this fantastic pin after knight d5, e d5. Um, black is already in deep trouble, bishop takes d5, we just win it because of the pin. So the bishop uh, will probably have to go back to d7. And now we can just play, we can play a bunch of moves here actually. Um, it's not clear even what is the best. Many moves win. For example, uh, taking on e6 and playing bishop g5 looks devastating because you can't go bishop e7 on account of queen takes g7. Black's position falls apart. Uh, you know, bishop f4 immediately is a very strong move as well, because black would love to go e5, doesn't need a brain surgeon to realise that we're not just going to let that move stand. We can just take on e5 and take back, and then go d6, winning our piece back. We can even take on g7 first, <laughs> and then go d6, winning our piece back, just every line wins. As long as you open up lines to that king, these kind of defences are, for the most part, not going to work. So, after knight d5, Grebyonkin played a move which uh, is probably the, the second best move in this position. Um, and that's the move bishop takes d5. Uh, maybe it's the third best move. Again, this move doesn't really work out. Um, the critical moves in this position are firstly the move bishop to e7. Uh, now, it's very difficult for a black player to play this move because you allow white to simply take on e7 with the knight and after queen takes e7 once again to play this move e5. And you can't take on f3, that would be a mistake on account of this is position of e takes f6, winning a piece. You have to take back on e5 and now knight takes e5. And this was seen in the game uh, John Shaw against Beliavsky in uh, 2008. And basically, uh, 
White is playing completely risk-free in this position. He's got ideas of developing the bishop out to g5 and playing rook ad1, very nice and centralized. Or you could even think about playing uh, with b3, put the bishop on b2 and play with c4. And you've got this lovely uh, pressure along the long diagonal against black's king. Whereas black, his bishop is clearly inferior. Uh, having the queen side majority versus the king side majority gives white additional flexibility. And even though the game sure Believsky actually ended in a draw, um, you know, I think uh, white has got a very, very uh, clear, uh, small, you know, small advantage in this position. So bishop e7 is a really tough uh, pill for black to swallow. So what else can he do? Well, actually, in this position, as it turns out, the move e5 might be best. And um, the difference between doing this here is that uh, compared to the lines where he goes e5 straight away, um, black can actually close the d-file at once. So, for example, after queen to d3, black can take on d5 and go bishop e7. So we wouldn't commit to a knight d5 so early against an earlier e5. This position is around balance. This is perfectly playable for uh, for white and black. You can go bishop g5 here, castles, um, play the move c4. Very, very standard position here. If black ever goes e4, um, this looks like it wins a piece, but he has to run in, he has to be careful of the move queen e2. And if he takes on f3 to take on e7, and actually this kind of um, uh, Variation works out for white. If you wanted to avoid all of this, of course, you could just take c6 first and after take c4. But I feel as though this position has a bit less bite. So as it turns out, after e5, if you really want to be aggressive here, you can play the spectacular move knight takes e5. And this is actually the move that uh, has been suggested as the best way for white. The point is that after d takes e5, what else? You have to play this move. Uh, queen takes e5 check. Uh, the, bit, the, the king uh, can move, but it's a bad move. You have to go bishop e7. So, for example, if king d7 here, white just plays the move queen to f5 check. The king goes back to e8, and now bishop g5. And now black has lost castling rights. White is a piece down, yes, but the position is absolutely horrific for black. For example, if he plays the move bishop e7 here, we can just take on e7, and after queen takes e7, go e5, and that's curtains for black. We're just going e takes f6 next. Black cannot move his king, get it castled, because he's already moved it. So, I mean, you know, and also I should point out that if black plays the move bishop takes d5, puke, uh, opening the e-file, e takes d5, bishop e7, now we can take on f6, and now we can take here like so. Once again, black is in huge trouble. d6 is threatened, queen takes h8 is threatened. Close to losing. So black, for the most part, after queen takes e5, will play the move bishop e7 immediately. This is the most natural move. And now with 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 white, we can't just swap down because we've, we've uh, sacrificed peace, but we can go knight c7 check, king f8, and take the rook in the corner. And after queen takes a8, uh, we reach a very, very interesting unbalanced position where white has won uh, two pawns and a rook for two pieces which traditionally is around equal in material terms. But in this particular position, given that black still has got major problems uh, getting his king safe and getting his pieces out, for example, if white just plays the move bishop d2 here, brings a rook to the d-file, I would take white here. Um, I'm not saying that it's clear-cut or anything like that, but I just think that white's coordination is that much better. And, and this is a good way to play uh, for a win. So e5 or bishop e7 are the best moves, but the move bishop takes d5 as played by Grebyonkin is probably uh, not quite working out for black because now after e takes d5 uh, and now e5, it won't take too many guesses after seeing the previous variations what white should do. Yes, indeed, the move knight takes e5. And this move is crushing because after d takes e5, queen takes e5 check, um, and now bishop to e7, white can just play the move d6, and after queen takes d6, we just take it because of the pin. We win our piece back with additional material. If black now moves his king to d7, 
We now play the move bishop f4, setting up a nasty mate in one threat with queen f5. And if black plays, for example, a move like g6, stopping queen f5 check, white can now play the move pawn to d6. And as it turns out, black is completely handcuffed here. There's nothing that he can do. For example, if he plays the move bishop to g7, white has got a whole bunch of moves that win. Everything wins. But I would recommend playing a move like probably queen to d4, threatening the move rook e7 check. And if rook e8, we can now just go rook e7 check anyway. Absolutely stunning stuff. Uh, the point is after rook takes e7, d takes e7, discovered check, king takes e7, we can now throw this check in, and the king never gets safe. For example, if king e8, we throw rook e1 check in, and if the king goes to d7, now we take on b7, and it's mate on the very next move. Absolutely glorious stuff. And so this position here basically is curtains for black. Rook e7 check is coming. Um, there's absolutely nothing that black can do. He can try the move knight h5, but once again, we can just fling this queen either to d5, that, that's good enough, or to b4, threatening queen takes b7, threatening rook e7, and there's nothing that, there's absolutely nothing that black can do. The, the, the dual threat's are too much. Knight takes f4, uh, queen takes b7 check, king takes d6, rook a d1 check is one very pretty variation. <clears throat> king to c5, b4 check, the king running up the board just like we like it, king to c4, queen c6 check, we give a check on b1, and after king a5 check, and mate finally. Obviously with the king running up the board, there should be checkmate there. So basically after knight takes e5, you can't take back on e5, it just doesn't work, you're just getting checkmated. So you have to go bishop e7, but this is obviously very sad to give up a pawn and a central pawn as easy as that. And now, many ways to play here. Um, the move knight g4 is absolutely clear cut, because after the move castles here, you can just play the move knight to e3 and put the knight on f5 next. White's pawn up easily. But Sutovsky also played perfectly fine. He played knight to f3, castles, bishop to g5, consolidating his pawn advantage, h6, bishop f4, rook c8, c4, knight d7, rook a c1. Playing very natural moves, bishop f6, queen d2, queen b6, b3, so far so good. a5, bishop to e3, queen to b4. Um, good try by Grebyonkin to try and uh, open some files, but after bishop f4, oops, the d6 pawn now falls. Take that off, thank you very much, take that off. Two pawns, exchange up, it's going to be a very easy conversion for somebody off the top speed level. So, all in all, the line involving uh, after rook e1, the main move is knight f6, but if they play an early a6, as per this game, I recommend just taking on c6, playing d4, getting that queen active, and you will pose your, prob your opponent's serious, serious problems. I think this is a really, really beautiful way for white to play.